Welcome to video two. In video one I explained to you what the top line consists of, what it is exactly. And here in video two I want to show you examples of horses with a good top line and then horses that have issues in their top line. And um, then you can compare that to your own horse and then you can see where your horse's top line is good and maybe where it needs some work. And so it uh, makes your job easier of, of interpreting the horse's top line. So in this video I want to show you um, a few pictures with examples of horses that have good, conf uh, good conformation and a good top, top line, well-developed top line, and then horses that have, you know, little issues with the top line. So to start out, here is um, a picture of a Lusitano stallion <clears throat> who has a fairly good top line, fairly well developed top line. You see it's a horse with good conformation, right? You see that there is a harmonious line here coming from the pole, you know, along the neck to the withers to the back and from the back to the croup. Um, so for a horse like this, it's not that difficult you know, to you know, carry himself properly, balance himself properly. And uh, when the horse goes in good balance, then he will use the correct muscles. And the development of the top line musculature really is the result of the posture in which the horse stands and moves most of the time, right? And the um, posture in which the horse moves um, has a lot to do with confirmation and uh, with the training. So <clears throat> the better the confirmation, the easier it is also for the rider to get the horse into a well-balanced posture and it, it's easier for the horse to find the right muscles, access the right muscles so they grow and develop. You know, if you have um, a horse that has conformational problems then it's a lot more difficult for the horse to access the right muscles. It's more difficult for the rider to bring the horse into balance and you see that a lot of horses with um, not so good top line have difficult conformation too. They, they often have a difficult transition from the lumbar spine into the pelvis. There is often a ridge of some sort, you know, there's a not a round smooth transition from lumbar spine to pelvis, but there is, is a ridge, a bump, you know, it's angular. And then <clears throat> horses with not so well developed top line also often have a difficult transition from the neck into the back so sometimes they have a dip in front of the withers in their top line because maybe the neck is set on too low right or they have a, a, a yeah, thoracic spine that's dropped down and so there there is a uh, the line of the back coming from the pelvis drops down and uh, then coops comes up into the into the wither. So uh, though those would all be factors that would make it more difficult for the horse to lift the base of the neck and lift the back and to engage the right muscles. Right? So here you see nicely the development of the, yeah, it's the trapezius muscle, right? And uh, you know, so the loin and croup looks fairly smooth. So here is a, another picture where you see the roundness of the croup very well. So uh, you see the smooth harmonious transition from the loin into the pelvis. The wider the loin, the back is, the stronger it is and that uh, yeah, makes it easier for the horse to transmit the energy of the hind legs from the pelvis through the lumbar spine, thoracic spine and so on to the reins, to the bit. And if this is uh, narrow and uh, sensitive, then it's it's prone to dropping, and then uh, the rider's weight is difficult to carry. And then you know, if the horse gets tight here in the loin area and uh, drops the back, then he'll also engage the under neck and uh, come above the bit. And you see here, actually, the way the horse is standing, you see a, a little bulge here in that that under neck muscle so that's a muscle that still has to disappear with more training as the horse lifts the withers more this will disappear more um, the more the horse lifts his 
neck like here is looking at something the more this engages so if you have a horse that is ridden a lot um, above the bit with too too much elevation you will see these under neck muscles here develop more and more <clears throat> um, they become hard they feel lumpy um, I've often seen it also in, in horses where the riders were balancing themselves with the reins right so if they are um, you know, hanging a little bit water skiing a little bit on the reins and these muscles often become quite prominent and they they bulge right or if you elevate the head and neck more than the hind legs can support and flex then you also see a um, you know, development of the the under neck muscles um, so, so here is a picture again of the loin transition from the back into the croup so that that looks very nice here um, everything is nice and round and smooth um, no corners angles no pointy areas in the um, in the de development of the top line so that that looks all very good here's another one another you know, picture where you see that fairly well so everything looks round and smooth so yeah here's another detail of the neck and you see here the neck is is held a little lower a little rounder and then the underneck muscle disappears so that's an interesting thing you know the more the horse lifts the withers and the the more he stretches the top line um, the softer the underneck muscles get whereas like if you have the horse mm, lifting the head because he wants to look at something then you see how this this muscle underneck muscle comes out and then it disappears when the horse releases the pole and uh, you see also how the neck um, flexes a little bit longitudinally here and uh, yeah, the, the straighter the neck becomes the more the underneck will um, start to show so the less longitudinal flexion there is right? so here you see from a little lower vantage point so but yeah you see it's a horse with very good conformation and the the muscle development is overall pretty good. Then we have the <laughs> exact opposite. So this is an old brood mare. That can happen um, when mares had a lot of foals that the, the ligaments stretch out too much and then the top line z uh, sags a lot. And of course, this is not the way, you know, the conformation used to be when the, before the babies but um, some, some brood mares develop this extreme sway back. And of course, a horse like that shouldn't be ridden anymore. But you could do some lunging and some work in hand to strengthen the belly muscles. So um, the horse stays healthy, at least, even without working and being ridden. Um, so that uh, might lift the, the back a little bit. So um, the horse leads a you know, healthier life, so to speak. And if you can strengthen the belly muscles here with some lunging and work in hand or double lunging. So that's just sort of an, an extreme example. And of course, you know, when um, you have an extreme sway back like that, then yeah, you can strengthen the belly muscles. So it's, it's not as extreme, but uh, you probably won't be able to get the horse really back into riding shape with, you know, so that the horse can carry a rider without hurting in her back or without damaging the back but um, yeah so could, you can use it as the lunging as maintenance for uh, the back and the belly muscles then here we have a horse that has a fairly short straight neck and it looks also like it's not set on very high and then when you have a short neck like this you run into issues of yeah, the neck not having enough length to elevate and flex at the same time. So you have to find the right combination. If you elevate too much, then the neck isn't long enough to become round and the horse to come on the bit. Right? If you prioritize like a vertical nose, so to speak, so the horse is really round and on the bit, then you can't give him very much elevation. So that's always a, a balancing act that, that you have to find. How much elevation can I get so he's still round and on the bit? And how low does the neck need to be so he's on the bit but without falling on the forehand? Because if you if you lower the neck too much, the horse will fall on the forehand, right? If you elevate too much, the horse will come above the bit. So it's a, it's a balancing act. And then the elevation always has... Um, 
a correlation with the flexion of the hind legs, right? The more the horse engages the hind legs and flexes them, the more he'll want to elevate the head and neck, right? As a, as a result of the collection. And um, so you have to juggle all the different different parts, right? And uh, so the, these horses then often have sort of a pretty even development of the top line at the top and the bottom. If you were to elevate the neck more, then you would develop more of that under neck, right? Then he wouldn't be on the bit enough, it wouldn't be round enough if you if you lift the head and neck too much. And um, yeah, so you have to, to find the right compromise, the right comp uh, combination so that these top line muscles develop as much as possible um, without developing the, the under neck. So then another example here that's that's interesting you see that uh, um, correlation a little bit between a fairly straight neck that's held very high and then the development of the under neck musculature um, you have see a little bit of um, the trapezius muscle here which is nice um, so if the horse goes you know on the bed through the back and lifts the withers then you develop these muscles here more the so this space fills out which is nice and then these muscle um, these muscles here will grow too um, and uh, you, you see how confirmationally the neck is set set on pretty high it's, it looks like it's uh, straight in itself so it doesn't have much of a natural curvature but it's uh, fairly long so you can uh, you know you have enough space for some elevation and then some longitudinal flexion so when you ride the horse he will probably be able to disengage that uh, under neck muscle and uh, you know, engage those muscles more and then so if this is the horse's natural way of standing then he will develop these under neck muscles maybe just from standing around and yeah, you know, looking like this, right? and uh, you know, riding him on the back, through the back on the bed, you will be able to develop these muscles, and you will be able to, yeah, you know, probably keep these muscles in check so they don't develop too much, right? So the loin looks pretty good, and the croup looks good. You also see that there's a confirmationally the transition from the loin into the croup is nice, long sloping croup. So uh, the the muscling here in this area looks pretty good so confirmationally the, the neck is a bit of a challenge but uh, since it's long enough you can get it to flex longitudinally as well right if this was a short fat neck then it would be difficult but since it's long enough this this is manageable right so yeah then uh, i have a few more examples so here you see a horse that yeah i hadn't Done anything for a little while so you also see here how the underneck is engaged and uh, the, the uh, top line muscle is not um, very developed here and uh, yeah, here it's not a, not a lot of lower back muscles but you don't see that as well but here you see the the neck especially fairly clearly and then we have a picture here I don't know a couple months later or so um, same horse now a little bit more regular training um, I had been basically double lunging him and didn't, done a little work in hand with him and then I taught some lessons with a student um, and uh, so you see how he's already changing shape right the top line muscles are already getting a little stronger he's getting a little rounder the under neck is receding you know so uh, and uh, it's a horse that doesn't have bad conformation at all. He look, he's actually pretty good. And uh, so, as if you continue to train him more and uh, ride him in balance, you'll see how these muscles will grow more. This hole here in front of the withers will fill in, and the underneck will will get smaller and smaller. So, and this is really not a whole lot of training between this picture and that picture. I don't know, two three months maybe. And not not very intense work either, you know. But uh, so he he came along fairly quickly. Actually, he changed fairly quickly. Yeah. Then here is an interesting example. It's a Frisian, I think, right? And uh, there you see some of the the conformational challenges that that this breed can have. So you see here the um, yeah line of the back drops from the withers 
and then rises again towards the the croup and you see a little bit of an an angle here a little bit of a, a pointy transition right from the lumbar spine into the pelvis which always makes it a little difficult then for these horses to uh, tuck the pelvis and lift the lumbar spine so the transmission of the hind leg energy through the back to the to the bit um, can be a little diffi more difficult to establish right and uh, so you can see because the the line of the back naturally drops a little bit um, it's more difficult than to to lift the back engage the hind legs flex the hind legs and then you of course if the horse finds that difficult then you see that the muscling here in the loin area isn't very strong you know and it's it's more difficult for this horse to access um these muscles right than than for uh this horse for example or or this horse it's just a different conformation type right so uh but these horses can also develop more muscles it just might be a little bit more difficult or take more time to to do that right so yeah in terms of the neck you know it's set on sort of medium high has enough length and so on so uh, the, the neck is not that difficult um conformationally the loin seems to be the most challenging part right so uh yeah, the more you can get the hind legs engaged and flex, the more he will lift here, right? So uh, you may have to accommodate the back a little with the seat and distribute your weight over a larger area. Um, if you were to sit heavily on your seat bones here, then you would basically press the horses back down into the ground and then the pelvis would rotate in the wrong direction and then these muscles would atrophy more and more, right? So you have to... Um, make sure that your seat allows the horse to lift his his back you know and to engage the hind legs the back and the hind legs are connected um, if the rider's seat prevents the uh, prevents the back from lifting then it also prevents the hind legs from engaging right? they're all connected with each other um, yeah so this is so this is a horse where you see the, the the lumbar spine especially transition into the pelvis it's not that easy right the croups itself has a nice round look to it but yeah, the other transition from lumbar spine to pelvis is a little challenging and that's that's where you see there could be a little bit more muscling there and you know in a way that lumbar spine and uh yeah the lifting of the base of the neck and the withers they're connected as well right so if the horse tends to drop the back a little bit then he will also tend to yeah, drop the withers right and uh, if you can get uh, the withers to lift um, the back will lift as well withers and back sort of go together and um, then so the you'll probably see the muscles in front of the the withers fill in and the muscles here in the lumbar spine also fill in more or less at the same time yeah and here I think that's a saddlebred. <clears throat> um, saddlebreds and Frisians are in some ways actually a little bit similar. They both started out as driving breeds or their saddlebreds were driven a lot too. Um, so you have some of the same issues. A lot of saddlebreds have very long necks like this and often they're very set on very high which then puts pressure on the on the back and uh, often the backs are long and narrow so they're not really made to carry a lot of weight and that can make it difficult here to do to build the muscle so you see lumbar spine also is sort of the the challenging area and the croup is nice nice and round essentially um, but there is a, a tendency also here for the line of the back to drop down from the pelvis and then rise deeply into the withers so for that confirmation again it's not that easy to lift the back and you may also have to be careful you know how much weight you place on your seat bones you know how heavily you sit you may have to spread the weight out over a larger area and keep the hind legs well under the body um, if you have that back confirmation together with very straight hind legs that don't flex easily naturally then 
it can make it more challenging, even can make it more difficult to get the back to lift. Or if you have hind legs that are naturally built out behind, which you also find in some of the saddlebreds and some of the, the Frisians, then, you know, the combination of a very high set neck and maybe a weak back and a, the hind legs that are out behind makes it very difficult to um, make the horse round and compact and, and lift the back and to develop the top line muscle. So here this horse luckily has hind legs that are underneath more, they're not out behind, which is good, that helps to lift the back. So the hind legs ultimately protect the back, the hind legs lift the back if they're engaged and if they're flexing. You know, the neck is nice, has nice elevation, nice length, and you have a neck here that's much deeper at the base and thinner at the top which makes it easier if you have a neck that's very thick here in the throat latch area then it's very difficult sometimes to get these horses um, on the bit and uh, to release the pole but so his, his head, uh, neck conformation is, is quite nice yeah then here we have a horse that also shows a, a weak loin right there is no muscling here um, in the, around the lumbar spine um, so that needs to develop with more training, right? So in, if, if the horses yeah, drop the back here, they won't be able to engage the hind legs, right? So you, this, uh, you have to allow the back to lift and engage the hind legs under the body. And then as, as the hind legs engage and flex, they can tilt the pelvis so that the uh, hip joints drop a little bit and uh, yeah, the pubic bone of the horse goes forward, right? And then that, that raises the lumbar spine a little bit and then the whole back comes up. <clears throat> Whereas if the, the pelvis rotates in the wrong direction, like when the basically the dock of the tail goes up and the pubic bone goes back, then the lumbar spine drops down, right? And there are breeds that have that a little bit in their conformation, like you see that in Arabs sometimes, you see it in some of the Lipizzans. And that, of course, makes the horse a little bit more challenging to ride, if that's the case. Yeah, so here, same horse, I don't know, a few weeks later, maybe, um, with a little bit of training, you see how these muscles here are starting to fill in a little bit, and uh, the lumbar spine has come up a little bit, so that here was the beginning, you know, the lumbar spine drops down from the from the hip, from the pelvis, and uh, here it's it's a little bit more level. So then another example here is a horse that had no muscling uh, along the back and along the croup when we started working with him. He's also very dirty. <laughs> and here's a, I don't know, seven months, I don't know exactly how long later, and you see how he's lifting the back more and uh, he's filled out a little bit in his pelvis and uh, so presents himself a little better. Conformationally he's actually good. Um, here the transition from the back to the croup is nice. Um, yeah, So he's looking away so you can't really see the um, development of the neck muscles very very well. Um, still needs to get more muscular of course but he's already improved some here th through his back loin croup area yeah then we have let's see here a quarter horse i think um so and of course in quarter horses you often have a croup high conformation which is challenging um because if the croup is high then the back drops so these horses will always also have a tendency to to drop the back a little bit and then it's more difficult to develop the back line, back muscles, top line muscles, and then uh, uh, if the withers are lower naturally then the, the croup is also a, a tendency then for the withers to, to drop and then the yeah, muscles here in front of the withers don't fill in so easily. So if you can uh, bring the hind legs more under and flex them, then um, and if you can teach the horse to lower the croup, then the, the difference between withers and the top of the croup isn't so high and then the horse can use his back a little better and uh, he'll be able to lift the withers a little so these muscles in front of the um, 
in front of the withers will grow more. <clears throat> so then we have, you see, I don't know, I think that's a diff different one, but similar, similar issue. Yeah, they, they have similar con confirmation, right? And here, um, yeah, you see big hindquarters in a, in a, in a sense, but it looks also slightly croup high. Um, and then as a result, the back line drops down from the uh, from the pelvis, if you'll go from back to front here, and then it comes up, up for the withers, and it looks like the neck, you know, is set on a little bit low, so there from the withers there's a little bit of a dip down, and then the neck gradually comes up again, right? So all these uh, dips and points in the that you see in some top lines, they make it more difficult for the horse to access the right uh, muscling in the right conformation but um, when you have this little dip in front of the withers you can make this disappear by building these muscles here so by when you ride the horse in such a way that he lifts the withers yeah, and then lifts the back then the, this space here fills in with muscles and then often you can make this this dip um, disappear you know, through the through the training so it takes takes a while, of course, to develop those muscles. And if you look at pictures of old like Spanish riding school stallions and so on, they have necks that look like mountains. There, everything is filled in here at the base of the neck. It's all one solid mass. But that takes quite a number of years of good training to to fill that in. So these muscles take some time. You know, you you can often see an improvement in a few months, um, but to really fill out the holes in front of the shoulder blade, in front of the, the withers, for example, takes many years, right? So uh, you have to be patient with that. Yeah, so here we have another example of, yeah, a little bit of a bumpy transition from loin to pelvis. And you can, you can see it looks like um, there could be more muscle, more muscles here on top of the croup and a little bit more here in the, in the loin area so that this yeah, starts to look rounder and smoother. Um, yeah, then let me see here, last horse. It's also towards the beginning of the, the training with this horse, and I still had more of a winter coat. Yeah, I see that uh, yeah, there's a bit of a, a bump up here, not, not a very round transition. He doesn't have a lot of muscles here on top of the croup. Um, and uh, yeah, his loin area is, is a little weak. That's a horse that uh, is difficult to ride through the back and on the bit um, because he's a little little weak in, in his back. And so the transmission of the forces of the hind legs through the back to the bit is challenging with this one. Um, yeah, and then here's another more of a close-up of the hind legs and you see how he would like to have his hind legs a little bit too far behind right so the toes are behind the behind the stifle joint so they don't the way they are standing here they're not supporting the back really right if the hind legs are out behind then they can't support the back and so the back drops and then the belly <laughs> line gets more convex and the back line becomes concave right and then you see here the here is a little bit of a, a gap in the muscling and there is a point here right? so uh, that's related right if the hind legs like to be out there then these muscles will atrophy right and uh, but uh, the belly will sag right and the more you can then engage the hind legs with the training um, and flex them the more the horse will fill in here because he'll lift the back more and also the the belly will then be tucked up a little bit more and then gradually these muscles here on the croup will develop so that's the, the same horse um, a little bit later I don't know, two or three months later maybe i don't know something like that so you you see how the back line looks much straighter he's here he's engaging the hind legs he's tucking the pelvis a little bit the belly doesn't sag anymore and uh, yeah so you see a, a smoother transition here from the lumbar spine to the croup and the, the loin muscles have developed a little more so 
So it's a, I mean, developing the top line is a lifelong project, so to speak. The, the muscles keep changing and um, growing or atrophying, depending on how the horses are moving and how they're, they're trained. And um, so, uh, yeah, you can influence the development of the muscles, of course, with your training, right? You can develop the right muscles or the wrong muscles. So it's, it's all a matter of balance, you know, engaging the hind legs, flexing the hind legs and helping the horse stay straight and balanced. And then they develop the right muscles when they're crooked and unbalanced and the hind legs are somewhere out behind then uh, there's nothing there to support the back and then the back muscles atrophy and then usually the underneck develops and the, the whole top line deteriorates. Right? So, uh, yeah, the more correctly you can ride the horse, the more balanced you can ride the horse, or uh, the better the top line muscle muscling will develop. So I hope that was useful information to you, and uh, we'll see you in the next video. So in this video, I showed you some examples of horses with good top lines and horses with not so good top lines. So, and as a homework, you could now look at the pictures you took of your own horse or go to the barn, look at your own horse and compare, you know, the horse to the uh, examples with good top lines, not so good top lines and see where your horse is and maybe post your observations. Maybe you can post which parts of the horse's top line are good and well developed, which parts of the top line could improve. And then, yeah, post them in the group. It will be interesting to compare notes.